Good morning, Hillside. How are we doing? It's a beautiful Sunday. We're excited to be here for worship today. Shanna, please keep it down on the front row. Um, my name is Ben. Before we get started is our Wednesday Worldview class. We've moved that to August. So if you're considering coming to the Worldview class, that's going to start now in August. So please be looking at your dates. Uh, that'll be on Wednesday, every other Wednesday night at 6.30 here at the church. Um, our hillside reading plan, we continue again this week. We're going to be in John chapter 10, verse 22, through John chapter 14, verse 31. That's where we need to be if you're trying to keep up with our reading plan. And then lastly is our hillside kids. So if you're looking for a way to get involved here at Hillside, the children's ministry is a, a great way to do that. I'm a little partial to the nursery. I think that's where all the cool kids are. But um, it, it, you can work in the nursery or you can work in the bigger kids' classes. Uh, but we would just love to have you over there to participate. And if you're interested in that or if you can, you can see Miss Laura for more details on Hillside Kids. Uh, and last but not least is our giving at Hillside. To, so thank you to everyone who gives and support Hillside. It's how we keep our lights on. It's how we keep the doors open. And we appreciate you guys so much. There's a few ways you can go about doing that. You can use your Faith Life app on your phones. It's probably the easiest way. You can also go to the website, which is hillsidechurchtn.org forward slash give, or you can use either one of our boxes here at our communion stations. So there's a couple different ways to do that. Thank you so much for those that do. And if you will pray with me, we will get started with worship. Or with uh, the sermon. <laughs> Quiet in the front row, please. Quiet in the front row. <laughs> This, this side of the room is off to a great start. Yeah. Okay, let us pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the many blessings that you have given us. Father, we pray for the church here at Hillside and for us to just return to worship. Just for us to make an effort, good Lord, to worship you and be true followers of Christ. Father, we pray that we can continue to focus on the gospel, and allow others to see your love through our actions. Father, we pray for our country and that we can come together as a nation to be united rather than be divided. Father, we pray for everyone involved in recent tragedies. Please provide the families with peace during the difficult times. Father God, we pray for your provisions, that you watch over us and you protect us. We pray for your guidance and for us to trust in your guidance. And may we have the ability to open our heart and our eyes so that we may see who you are calling us to be. Father, we pray for this church. and We feel your presence here at Hillside, and we are so grateful and excited to worship you. We pray for the children here. Um, please watch over them to ensure that they are led to you, and please be with their precious caretakers. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm arguing that there needs to be a reformation in our substance. There needs to be a reformation in our framing. There needs to be a reformation in our thinking. There needs to be a reformation in our presuppositions about worship. And what is she, I mean, worship is a great thing to talk about. I mean, worship is all about the heart, connecting with God with affection and wonder and awe and repentance and love and praise. It's all about what's going on here. I don't think in the teaching of Jesus, and especially in the teaching in John's gospel, you would ever see spirit and truth separated. I think when Jesus talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth here, he means the spirit, not so much your spirit or my spirit, but I think he means the Holy Spirit, who in this gospel is referred to as the spirit of truth. Good morning, church. If you've been with us, or even if you haven't, we've kind of reversed the order. We're doing the sermon first, worship second. It made sense uh, to me that as we would teach through worship, have the opportunity to worship after the sermon was over. Um, and so 
one thing I want to, to say that we're doing in this series as well is, and actually moving forward, uh, we have taken our men's group and our women's group, and we have actually, we're going to combine them. And so whether you are single or married, it, it doesn't matter. But for the next, our, our next two gatherings in June, our Bible study on Monday, this starting tomorrow, will actually be over this sermon and the prior sermon. We're going to sit and discuss it. So if you want to be a part of it, the, the, uh, the cool thing is, is we won't get through all of it. So there's so much content. Michelle looked at it and she goes, how in the world are we going to do all this? So we won't. You'll be able to take some of it home with you as a personal Bible study, which I think is great. And um, so you're welcome to join us tomorrow here at 630 for that. But uh, we really want to take this season before we get into the book of Daniel and understand what worship is. And so please come and join us if you can. From 630, we're out by 8 and we'd love to have you. So last week, we laid the foundation of what does it mean to be a worshiper. That worship is more than music, and to be a worshiper begins with all of life submitted to the glory of God. And what we talked about was this, is that the goal is not to decorate temples or climb mountains, but to examine hearts. It's not whether we sing hymns or modern music or any preference, but that we prepare our lives as an offering of worship to God. And, and, and if I could give you worship in a nutshell, this is the foundation that we, we, we lay upon. That from Jesus' own words, we are warned that it is very possible to, to honor God with our lips, but our hearts be far from him. And, and that is never the goal of worship or the goal of being a worshiper. And in this today, um, we're going to move forward, and, and I want to visit this topic of wonder, this idea of wonder. Because you see, today we live in an age of understanding. We collect information on everything. If you want to know something about anything, you can go to Google and you will get that information. We have documented species of plants, animals. We have documented climates, oceans, and stars. And there has been this revolution in human thought. And there have been incredible advancements in medicine, our quality of life, and how we daily live, and even in how we communicate. Man, I remember, and some of you, some of you are old enough in this room, you don't have, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I remember when we had to get up and change the channel on the TV, right? Today, we carry the TV in our pockets, right? But it's also created a problem, a number of problems actually, but the one I want to highlight today is this, is that we live as if there is no more mystery in the world. We see almost everything around us within the limits of how our world has been defined. Our knowledge, in a sense, it's become this intellectual prison. And when we come to church, we see the same thing to a degree. We expect to hear the same things, sing the same things, and do the same things. And we can look up and have this expected mindset of even coming together and gathering together as God's church. You see, I believe if we woke up every Sunday with the expectation that God would be revealed to us in such a way that it would leave us in awe, in wonder, that we would never miss a day. We would be here every Sunday. We would be here every time the door was opened if we had this idea of awe and wonder. One of my favorite things that I, I did, a, a, and I think they're doing a, a docu another documentary on it, on the Jesus movement that happened in the 70s. And it was this giant revival. And here's how excited they were. Some of them would come to church early and they would start worshiping God without a worship leader on stage. Church hadn't even started yet. They would show up in the sanctuary and all together they would gather in the house of God and they would just start singing. It was amazing to see some of the things that happened during the time. But we have lost this idea of wonder. 
Let me give you an example of the intellectual prison we are in. In a marriage, one man and one woman give birth to a child, and mathematically, that one plus one plus one is three. In fact, today we describe children in the womb as a clump of cells that grow into human life. This description lacks wonder. It lacks wonder. When a mother sees her newborn baby for the first time, she doesn't gaze upon that baby's face and go, one plus one plus one is three. She doesn't go, look at the clump of cells. Through her heart, she sees her whole heart wrapped up in a child. It's wonder. It's wonder. You see, in our society and even sometimes in church services, we are losing our sense of wonder. But I I believe this wonder is something God intended for every human being to have. Jesus says something that doesn't sound like it makes sense to what I'm saying, but stay with me on this. He says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And there are a few reasons that Jesus makes this statement in terms of humbling ourselves, but perhaps wonder is part of the reason why Jesus describes believers in this context. Have you ever noticed children? Children marvel at things. They're amazed. Their eyes will become so big when they see something so simple that they've never seen before. Put a bowl of ice cream with 20 scoops in it in front of a child, and they're going to go, whoa. (laughs) Put it in front of me as an adult man, whoa. Right? Wonder. Real wonder. And maybe if we took on the perspective of a child, we would live in wonder of everything that God has done, everything God is doing, and we would see our faith differently. There is wonder all around us. G.K. Chesterton, he says this. He says, the world will never starve for want of wonders, but only for want of wonder. What does the statement mean? In other words, despite our knowledge, Despite our explanations of life, we are surrounded by wonder, yet we're losing this lifestyle of what does it mean to live with wonder, with awe. And from a Christian standpoint, let me give you another perspective. Last week, we talked about all of life uh, being lived in submission to the glory of God. This week, I want to add to that, that all of life is meant to be lived in wonder of God. The entire Bible, when you think about it, is filled with God's wonder. Man, one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me is I had read my Bible on and off all my life, even before I was a committed believer, because my mom made me go to church. Moms keep making your kids go to church. They might be bored as all get out, but it doesn't matter. Eventually they get it. But the Bible is filled with God's wonder. From creation to redemption to eternity, we should never exhaust the limits of wonder in one human lifetime as it pertains to God. We could never imagine so much that we would fully understand the wonders that there is of God. You see, I think eternity is going to blow our minds and we never think about it. We almost never think about it. Revelation says this. I'm going to give you an example. It says this, And night will be no more. They will need no lamp or light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Church, imagine the day with no more darkness. It says night will be no more. Imagine the day we look up, and rather than seeing the sun in the sky, We see the glory of God, and that's our eternity. Why don't we wonder? Why don't we stand in awe of such a fact that all of creation is going to be illuminated by the glory of God? 
Imagine the wonder of that moment, but somehow we who are specks in a vast universe, imagine we know everything and that there's no room left for wonder. How arrogant are we? You see, an atheist will look at a Christian and say, we are living in willful ignorance. But that is not what wonder is. Most certainly, we should educate ourselves, understand and grow in knowledge, but we should never limit our responses to what we know. You see, wonder is often an amazed reaction to what we discover, but it's also a realization of what is unknown, that there's more to this, that there's more to my life. Even in the season that I'm in, there's more than this. And I submit to you that biblically and scientifically, we need biblical wonder. For example, the danger of theology and all the debates I read online is that one group imagines that they have God figured out more than the other. For me, it's almost comical. When every week I open my Bible to prepare a sermon for this place on Sundays, and I am shown something brand new that I didn't understand before, and I walk in here understanding that God has taught me before I teach you, And I will never, ever lose my humility and imagine that I come before you as an informed person. God is still growing me too. And every week, it is a moment of awe. It is a moment of wonder. And it's usually something unexpected. It can be small. It can be big. But God shows me. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we should abandon theology. In fact, we should go back to those theological wells and and drink deeply from them with a sense of wonder, not diminishing God's word completely to the limits of human understanding, but recognizing the mystery and the wonder of God that we could somehow, that if if we could define God, our definition would always fall short. We do it scientifically as well, not just theologically. When scientists attempted to understand the beginning of the universe rather than a creation moment with God, we had a big bang, reducing what God had done to some formula, but it misses wonder. It misses wonder. And I'm not saying we should abandon science. In fact, true science thrives on wonder. And we've lost this in the world, and I think we've, we've lost this in the church. And I love, I love what Wearsby says here. He says this, the church once lived on the dangerous but exciting edge of miracle. T- today, the church has both feet planted firmly on the ground and doesn't dare to venture out where the bushes are burning. In other words, the miraculous is all around us, but we are so set in our ways that right outside of our doors and outside of our sight, there are bushes burning. It's a reference to Moses, the bush that would not burn up. What a picture of where we are at today. And maybe we need a fresh look at what it means to live in the wonder of God. And as we continue in our understanding of worship, we cannot go any further until we first discuss this pillar of wonder in the Christian life. So if you have your Bibles, go to Psalms 86. And we are going to read verses 8 through 13. Psalms 86, verses 8 through 13. Verse 8 says this, And this is David talking, he says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. 
Let's stop there. So King David, if you look at the first handful of verses that we didn't read in this chapter, he has this great need. And in Psalms 86, he recognizes the wonder and the majesty of God to meet his needs. And and though nations worshiped idols, God is exalted above them all and God is the only true God. And in this psalm, David, he even mentions the true temple, what we talked about last week, that your heart and mine, the temple, we are caretakers of that temple where the Spirit of God dwells. And David distinguishes God from all creation, and he longs to know the things of God, to be taught his ways, to walk in God's truth, and to live with this reverent fear of his name. And and I want you to understand this. This is important, especially when we pray. That when David asks God for something, it's not obtainable by David by his own efforts. He needs God's help. He needs his help, and, and so do we. So we worship, we live in wonder, knowing that there's more to all of life that we possibly could, we couldn't understand without God's help. We couldn't do this on our own. How do you see worship? When you worship God, you understand what you're doing. See the paradox of Christian worship. Because in worship, we want to see what can't be seen. We want to know what isn't known. And we long for a presence that cannot be felt by human hands. It is the paradox of worship. It's beyond you. It's beyond me. And we cry out to God for the unknowable, the unseeable, the unfelt. It's wonder. And it is only God that makes this possible. God gives us the ability to see and God has made himself known. And and, and in the deepest of worship, it is only in that wonder that his presence can be felt. Your knowledge of God is not because of your intellect. Let me say this again. Your knowledge of God is not because of your intellect. It is because of his gift. You see the dramatic difference between information and revelation. Information is something we discern. Revelation is something that's shown. There is a difference between information and revelation. Look, and I know we take this for granted because most people here read the word and study that I know. But there are a number of people who study scripture but don't know God. They read every verse and they don't know God. There are people who teach at universities, people who attempt to quote scripture grossly out of context, and they don't understand the true meaning of the word or the God of the word. But why? Why? Unless I am willing to come to Scripture in reverence with a heart of wonder, knowing that everything I learn is a gift given to me by God in revelation, I will miss the entire point of reading. You can memorize the Bible and miss the God of the Bible. Is memorizing the Bible good? Man, you can do that. That's great. I'll trade places with you. It'll be awesome. But without a wonder of God, an understanding of the God who wrote it, it doesn't matter how much you know. You see, revelation is God revealing his nature to us, his commands, his precepts, and we can read and through his his spirit, we can truly understand When is the last time you opened your Bible in in this perspective of wonder? God, show me something today. Maybe you said, when's the last time you said the words of David in verse 11 of what we just read? Imagine opening your Bibles and saying, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And you look down 
and you start reading with that type of wonder. When's the last time you did it? It's probably been a while for many of us. You see, we have to understand God must do the the revealing for us to see, but we must do the following to obey. Our obedience to what we have been given is now this act of worship because as God reveals his nature and his will to us, we respond with all creation to God and, and our obedience as worship. And with this perspective, obedience doesn't become a drudgery for the believer. It becomes joy. Imagine this. You read, you read the word and you see something you need to correct in your life. And God, in, in, through his spirit in your life, says, man, this is, this is how you draw closer to me. These are the things that I want you to do. And you don't do this because you want to quit something you like doing. You just want God more. So you stop. You confess sin. God, this is how I draw closer to you. God, I want to have an elevated view of you so that my life changes. But that's not how we look at our preferences, but we should. We should. God, I so desperately want you that if it costs me everything, I'll do it. I'll do it. That's wonder. That's having this awe of God, this wonder of God that is so great that I am willing to be who he wants me to be. You see, people who worship God in obedience experience this. Listen to John 14, 21. This is Jesus talking. He says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself in him. Isn't it worth giving away our preferences for such a promise? But that's typically not how we look at our sin. It's not. But the beauty of wonder is, is that he's worth every sacrifice. I'll do it. Where do you want me to go, God? I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Whatever you want me to leave behind, I'll leave behind. That's wonder. That's worship. Church, why have we relegated worship to songs we sing one day a week? when a lifestyle of worship is often found in this wonder and obedience, inviting the presence of God ever more so into our lives. So there are three major categories presented in Scripture that reveal the nature of God as we understand Him in wonder and in worship. There's more than three, but there's three major, and I want you to see them. Because if you're going, okay, Dave, I get this. I really need to work on what my awe is set towards. What do I, do I wonder in the, the majesty of God in my worship? My only concern is I feel like I'm doing you a slight disservice here because each of these categories are their own sermon. Each one of them are their own sermon, but I'm going to brush through them quickly. So the first one is this. Let's look at the wonder of God as creator. This is Revelation 4, 10 through 11. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. So they look in wonder at, at, at God as creator. And we're, we're given this picture of the throne room of God and the 24 elders. And you may ask, why 24 elders? More than likely, scholars believe that 12 of the elders were the, the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, and the other 12 elders were the apostles. That's why there's 24 elders that are listed in, in the book of Revelation. And this total number would consist of the leadership of God's chosen people. And in this passage, 
They worship God as creator, that he made all things, and by God's will, all things exist. You're breathing right now because of the will of God. And this recognition of God as creator and worship, it's a sharp contrast to an atheist, for example, who believes that we are a cosmic accident. What's the premise of God as creator? What is the premise of imagining your life as an accident? What type of foundation do these things lay in our lives? Because it's one of two things, right? Either our lives are random and we are masters of our own fate, or our lives are accountable to the God who created them. It's one or the other, right? You you may love somebody and submit yourself to that person, but even if you did love that person, you're doing it for what they give you and what they make you feel. It's another thing to to battle through marriage when you have difficult times, but you stay together because the God who made us said that we were supposed to. And marriage works. If it was just based on feeling, Michelle and I wouldn't be married. The first two years of our marriage were horrible, and she'll tell you that, right? But you know why we stayed? God told us to. And when two people submit themselves, it takes two. Submitting themselves to the will of God and the glory of God. I would have missed out on the most wonderful person I've ever met. It is the difference between an accident and my will versus what God wants for my life. And I'm a grateful man as a result. But that is God as creator. This is how we were made. God as creator matters because even for this example, we would worry less about our needs if we understood God as creator. Listen to Jesus again. This is Matthew 6. It says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus tells his followers not to be anxious about anything. Why? Because God is creator. Birds eat. Lilies are clothed in beauty. And the same God that made them sustains us. Jesus doesn't tell them to budget or plan here. He tells them that God provides. Budgeting and planning are good things, but they mean nothing without God's provision. And look, I could go further into this one. I could talk about Peter catching a fish to pay a temple tax. I could talk about manna in the Old Testament feeding people in the middle of the desert. I could talk about the ram God provided for Abraham's sacrifice rather than his own son. God as creator is still providing today. God's creative nature helps us understand our resources. In 1 Chronicles, King David, he's preparing the resources needed for his son Solomon to build God's temple. All the people give. And the people are so zealous for God that they give more than enough for the temple to be built. And David, what he does is he blesses the Lord in front of everyone for what's been given. And and listen to part of his blessing. This is what he says. He says, both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? 
For all things come from you, and of your own we give unto you. The wonder of God as creator is that no matter how little or how much you have, we are merely caretakers of God's belongings. It's not mine. It's not yours. When we understand that we can't keep what we have, that we come into this world with nothing, and when we die, we leave it all behind, it's much easier to understand our stuff. It's this act of worship that, God, I can take what you've given to me and I can do something to honor you. God, I can take what you've placed in my hands because I know you love every person that I can place in another. This is in sharp contrast to a culture who loves stuff the newest and greatest, you will look at your belongings and believe that they are yours or that they belong to God. And the wonder of God as creator will change how you view what you have and how you view what's been given to you. So when we wonder wonder in God as maker, everything we have is blessing and everything we give is worship. That's God as maker. And that should make us wonder, should be in awe that everything he's done for us, everything that he's given to us, whether you are poor or rich, it's a blessing. And what he allows you to give, it's worship. God is creator. Now let's look at the wonder of God as redeemer. And to understand God as redeemer, we must first see ourselves as sinners. This is the hardest part. The Bible's very clear on this one. I, I don't want you to think I'm making this up. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I cannot see the glory of redemption until I see the depth of sin. If I think I'm a pretty good person and God made me a better person, I will miss the point of God as Redeemer. And I will miss the point of wonder in God as Redeemer. You see, we, we, we have to understand God as creator before we can understand Christ as redeemer. Why is that? Because from the very beginning, there was a natural order of things. God is creator and man is creation, and that order was violated by man's will. And we imagined our lives belong to us and not to God, and redemption is possible when our lives are given back to God, the God who made us, and now the God who saved us. So we see the full order of things through, through maker and through redemption. That we were made a specific way. You're not a cosmic accident. Your life is not your own. A God in heaven made you, ha- had a plan for you to live a specific way. We violated it. Now we need that redemption. God as maker and God as redeemer are tied together in this sense. You see, if I am... In, in all of this, let me push this forward here. When we wonder in God as our Redeemer, when we get to this place that we understand that we were made a specific way and God is getting us to return to that way, those who wonder in God as Redeemer, they set a high value in their lives of the price that was paid for them. The cross means something. The fact that it's empty means something to the person who sets a high value to what Christ has done. You see, if I'm literally in love with the God who saved me, I will care about worshiping God with my life. I will long to be how God originally designed me to be. But it's when we lose our wonder for the Redeemer that the temperature of our lives begins to change. And what do I mean by that? Back to Revelation again. Jesus talks to the church in Laodicea and says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
See, to be lukewarm, it's a life with no zeal, no discipline, no sacrifice, no wonder. Jesus wishes they were cold or hot because both temperatures are sincere and appropriate responses to redemption. One of the books that changed my life in 2005 was a book called Crazy Love by Francis Chan. And this statement still floors me today, no matter where I think he's at right now. He said this. He said, lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. Ouch. It's like we're playing Monopoly and we want the get out of jail free card. Those living lukewarm want the benefits of faith, but not the commitment of it. They want the redemption, but not the redeemer. If you are here just because you don't want to go to hell, you're missing the point entirely. But if we cling to the wonder of the gospel that God so loved the world that when we were entirely lost, God doesn't leave us in darkness. The lamb was slain, his life was given, and he rose from the grave. And because of this, we are free. We should never grow dull to such a gift. And the problem is, I think we hear it so much, it's almost like the air conditioner effect, right? When the air conditioner first comes on, it's really loud, but after it's been on for five minutes, you quit hearing it. It's background noise. The gospel was never meant to be background noise for your lives. Never. We were supposed to stay in in wonder of what's been done for us. Listen, the only general difference between someone living wholeheartedly for God and someone living lukewarm, I believe the only difference, the only major difference is wonder. It's wonder. Why do we sin? We lose our zeal for God. Our preferences start to take over. All the different things happen. We have a desire that, that we think that we should, we should meet even though God doesn't want us to do it. And we lose our wonder no matter how long you've been in church and no matter how educated you are. It's how it happens. We lose our wonder of our redemption and of what God has done. That somehow in lukewarmness, the cross became less important than our schedules and our desires. But the person living in wonder sees the cross as life and lives like the the, the cross and redemption, resurrection, ascension, that it's the only life. Wanting no one to perish without Jesus, they even speak of their heart's desire. That's what it means to live in wonder of the Redeemer. And when we wonder in God as Redeemer, all life and worship are recognition of what's been done for us. And when we get this, our hearts beat passionately for the life given to us. And this passion stems not just because we were alive and saved from death, but because of a desire to live out the very life that we've been offered. It's not just about the fact that you get to live forever. You get to live with Christ forever. You get to look up and where the sun was, the glory of God is. Why does that not excite us? Why do we lose sight of something like that? Why do we yawn at something like that? It's amazing. It should take our breath away. In all of this, there is a way we choose to live in worship. Because without wonder, it would betray the very gift given to us otherwise. Man, it's one thing to stand and the the worship band's not playing the song you like. That's not wonder. It's, God, thank you for everything that you've done for me. may, May I never take it for granted. And may I live with my efforts, my energy, my worship, my wonder and awe in such a way that no matter the season I'm going through, you are with me.
We have to, we have to find our wonder again. And it leads us to the final wonder that we're going to discuss today. It's the wonder of God as king. The day is coming when Jesus is going to come back again. And we look at the book of Revelation and we, we see this picture of a kingdom being established. Revelation says this of Jesus. It says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And not only is a kingdom coming, but a king is returning. And not just any king, but Jesus, king over all kings and Lord over all lords. And this wonder in our worship of God as king, it's one of exaltation. God, all of your promises are now coming true. And there's, the day is coming when we're going to see it. Because you are king, there's nothing that can stop you. This is what's going to be my future and my life. This is who I am destined to be because of your authority. The Christian not only recognizes God's creation and God's redemption, he recognizes, she recognizes God's authority and the beauty of that authority. This authority is life-giving. When Jesus was here, this is in, in Mark. I wanted to spread this out a little bit. And they're talking about Jesus, it says, and they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Why does Jesus heal people? It's great that they're healed. It's, it's great that they're set free, but eventually they're going to die again. What's the point in the healing? He raises Lazarus from the dead, but eventually Lazarus dies again. Jesus is demonstrating the kingdom and the authority that he ultimately will have over all the earth. Every healing is a characteristic of the kingdom that we're about to inherit. Every demon cast out is the represent, representation of a kingdom that will have no evil within it. That's Christ's authority. Not only did he teach the kingdom, he showed the kingdom to everyone who was listening to him. And it's the wonder of God as king. People were being healed because of authority. People were being set free from bondage because of authority. And one of the many reasons we should submit our lives to the authority of God is because of what his authority brings. When Jesus rises from the dead, he, he has now demonstrated his authority not only over demons and sickness, but over death itself. And he says, let me show you the kingdom that's coming. Jesus says, I'm alive. He even eats to prove to them that he's not a ghost. The beginning of Jesus' final words in the book of Matthew after everything is accomplished in the resurrection. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And when the disciples hear these words, they're not worried about meeting the demands of Jesus. They are overjoyed. And here stands before us as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, it, and it's such an awesome moment that they see him ascending. And the angels have to tell him he's going to come back the very same way. This is a moment of awe. This is a moment of commissioning. This is a moment of wonder. You see, when we worship God in, in authority and the wonder of his authority. God changes everything. If you're at your lowest point right now, praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because of his authority over my situation, over my life, over what I'm facing, over what my desires are, and God, I want what you have. You are the authority of my life. 
Jesus, you are king. You are king. I don't know how this is going to work out, but God, you're the authority. Let's talk about the uncomfortable authority of God for just a second. Let's talk about the wonder of God's judgment. Why should we praise God because he's coming to judge? It's a fair question, right? Because this, first off, it, it, sounds, it sounds pretty horrible. But there are many places in the Bible where people praised God for his judgment. And we, we don't look at it. We don't see it. Let's look at one place. This is Psalms 96, 11 through 13. It says this, Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. This is a worship of judgment. That God's going to judge the world. And for some reason why, the psalmist is rejoicing. And and here's what I want to say to you. If we are unmoved by the judgment of God in worship, maybe we have forgotten the havoc that sin has laid upon the world. Maybe we have not seen the depth of what sin has caused. And when God comes to judge, this will be no more. Sin will be gone. Evil will be gone. And that his judgments are just. They're good. He will judge the world in righteousness, faithfulness, the qualities that that God has been trying to instill in each and every one of us. Man, I have heard preachers preach hellfire and brimstone, and to an extent, I understand why. But God's judgment against sin and sinners, it's fierce. So I get it. But for the believer, for the person living for God, in wonder of God, seeking after his righteousness, trying to be faithful in the Christian life. Judgment is glorious because the condition of everything around us is about to change. And it's going to be wonderful. It's joy. It's the beginning of Christ's kingdom. And John sees all the judgments and revelation and the kingdom established. And in chapter 22, After seeing all these things, it says he falls on his knees and he worships because of everything that's about to take place. The joy that is set before every person following Christ. And as we consider these categories today of wonder, no, there's more. We could talk about um, uh, so much. We could God, not just God as creator and redeemer as king. We could talk about God as, as intercessor. We could talk about uh, God as helper. These things that are reflected in scripture. But when I understand the three, God is creator, God is redeemer, Christ is king. I understand greatly how I should live a lifestyle of worship. So in worship, for, as we gaze upon, uh, across these three that I gave you today, we worship the one who made us, who saved us, and leads us. It's why they're considered the core three. Because in wonder, if we were to look across God as creator, God as redeemer, God as king, We know where we come from. We know who saved us. And we understand who is leading us and why. You see, I believe to live out a complete Christian life, we need constant reminders of everything that God has done for us. He is our maker, our savior, our king, but there's more. He is our high priest, our intercessor. Many more reasons why we should live in the wonder of the living God. But there's a warning I want to end with in regards to wonder. A a tremendous warning. From what I see, every human being, every human being, Christian or not, is wired for wonder. And what you do with wonder matters. 
the very thing that, that captivates us can either destroy us or give us life. We were all meant for wonder. And when wonder is set upon anything but God, it can only lead to idolatry. It can only lead to idolatry. Every human being has the capacity to wonder, to be in awe. And who you find your wonder in, what you find your wonder in, will direct your life. And it's huge. It's the epidemic of our nation currently. It's happening within the church. But make no mistake, whatever it is that captivates us outside of Christ can only lead us to the captivity we see in the world. Wonder is important. It's incredibly important to understand. For the Christian, let us see God's hand in creation. Let us look upon the cross in gratitude. And let us look to our king in service. The man or woman in awe of the, of the God who made us, who saved us and now leads us, that person will live with a greater reason to be alive, possessing a greater knowledge of what to live for and a greater understanding of what it means to worship God. The question today is simple. Where have you set your gaze? What draws you to this place of awe and wonder? What occupies the time that you have to do whatever you want to do? When you're free and you choose to do something, what pulls you in most? Are you in awe and wonder of God? Or is there something else that has captured your gaze? It will make or break the Christian life, in my opinion. And I would want that for none of us. Let us look upon the glory of God again. Let us open his word again with this heart of awe and wonder and say, God, show me something new. Show me how to be a worshiper, a real worshiper. And God, use me for your glory. Amen? Let's pray. God, as we prepare our hearts for communion, God, let us remember. God, let us remember not just the facts about who you are. Let us remember the awe and wonder of who you are. God, as we take communion, and we enter a time of worship. God, let the words that we sing reflect a heart in awe and wonder of you, of your creation, of your redemption, of your authority. And God, I ask right now that you forgive us. Forgive us for the times that we have set our gaze on something else and God, that we have not made our, our lives what you would have it be. Whether it's our addictions or, or whether it, it is our, our own personal desires. God, return us to the person you would have us be. God, let us look to the son. Not only your son, but he, God, as we see the sun that shines now, knowing it's going to be replaced with your glory and that we will be with you forever. Let that bring us to a place of awe. Let, us, let it bring us to a place of wonder. And God, let us look afresh upon your word and your majesty. And God, let us worship you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's take about two minutes and we'll prepare for communion. Thank you.
At this time, you release for communion. Thank you. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. Then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of my covenant poured out for you. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. Will you stand with us? your face I long for you you are my hiding place my safe refuge I find my hope in you your peace it carries me through Grace deeper than the sea, conquered the grave. You paid it all for me, your love displayed. There is power in your name. I give.
summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with
Well, now.